Chairman of the Senate Business Professions and Economic Development Committee. Thank you uh, to all the committee members who are here or will be here uh, shortly at uh, different times and coming in and out. And thank you to the panelists who are participating uh, and to the members of the public uh, who are encouraged to speak at the end of the hearing during the public comment period. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Senator Lonnie Hancock who will be participating in today's hearing and someone who has been very much affected by the tragedy in Berkeley and has been taking a lead on the issues pertaining to, uh, to, to construction and construction defects and the problems that have, have, been, have come to light uh, since the, uh, the tragedy. It's unfortunate that so often it takes a tragedy to expose potential problems with the government's ability to protect the public. As lawmakers, it's our responsibility to determine if improvements need to be made to prevent future tragedies. Since we're coming up on the one-year anniversary, uh, uh, today's hearing will give us an opportunity to learn about the state's response to the June 15th, mm -hmm. June 16th, 2015 Berkeley balcony collapse that killed six students and injured seven others. The firm that constructed the apartment complex, Segway Construction Company, had a history of questionable work and in previous years had paid out $26.5 million in construction defect settlements. The state's construction watchdog, the contractor state license board, didn't have a mechanism to flag and investigate contractors with a history of defect settlements, since they don't collect the information like other licensing boards. The board's chief of enforcement stated that, quote, had we known about the suits and the underlying reasons for them, we would have absolutely taken action. It is routine for other professionals such as architects, accountants, and engineers to report settlements and judgments to their appropriate regulator. Because of this loophole in state law, Senator Hancock and I authored Senate Bill 465, which seeks to require contractors to report certain settlements to the contractor state license board so the regulator has sufficient information to properly oversee its licensees and to protect the public. Since AB 465 is pending in the Assembly Committee on Business and Professions, this hearing will be the first opportunity for the Senate to explore the policy issues surrounding the Berkeley balcony incident and its potential implications for reforms. I would also like to express my sincere condolences to the friends, families, and the communities, both in California and in Ireland, that have been affected by this tragedy. And hope this hearing uh, will shed light on what California can do to prevent future tragedies from occurring. We are also grateful to have the Honorable Philip Grant, Council General of Ireland, with us today from the Irish Council uh, General's San Francisco office. Uh, Mr. Grant, we look forward to hearing your remarks at the beginning of our public portion of the public comment portion of our hearing. I'd also like to welcome Jackie Donahoe to whose daughter Ashley tragically lost her life in that most uh, unfortunate incident last year. Senator Han Hancock, welcome. Thank you, and thank you, Senator Hill, for having this hearing and for really spearheading the bill that we hope to get through the legislature and on the governor's desk this year. Um, you know, the balcony collapse on June 16th uh, in Berkeley stunned our community and rocked the country of Ireland as well. Uh, the family and friends of the 13 young adults um, who died, who were just in Berkeley for the summer working on, on visiting visas, was ex just an extraordinary loss. And my husband, who is the mayor of Berkeley, and I saw firsthand the devastation that this brought to the families. It was truly a nightmare for all of us who lived it. Imagine how we felt when we found out that the company that had constructed the building had a history of substandard construction. They had, in fact, paid multiple fines uh, over the last decade for <clears throat> for faulty construction, including things like water intrusion, which was one of the causes of the defects in these balconies. In fact, in 
just the three years prior to the balcony collapse in Berkeley, uh, there was over 26 million in settlement fees paid out by the, the construction company. Now, in every case, uh, what we found was that settlements, because that's what these are, they weren't fines, excuse me, they were settlements, uh, don't have to be reported to the state contractors board. So they're never alerted that there may be a situation to look into. Um, we hope that that will change as a result of our legislation. In the meantime, the city of Berkeley also adopted a number of changes to their local inspection ordinances, um, stricter requirements on balconies, and regular maintenance inspections for units already built. Um, I would like to see, as this evolves, that we also make um, our building codes reflect that so that that becomes the practice all over the state. But in many ways, our, we will never be the same because of the tragedy that happened. But we can heal by trying to make sure it never happens again. And that is uh, what we're trying to do. And I thank oh. Senator Hill and the committee for the hard work and seriousness with which they've taken this. No. Thank you, Senator Hancock. I, I, I think the, the whole state of California has been touched by that tragedy, and uh, we'll make the changes necessary. Senator Block, welcome. Would you like to make some comments this morning? Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I simply want to thank you and Senator Hancock for bringing, bringing forth this really critical legislation to help avoid future tragedies like the one that we saw last year. It protects not only your constituents, Senator Hancock, um, who have already suffered greatly, but uh, but mine down in San Diego as well. So um, I, I look forward to following the progress of the bill as it makes its way through the legislature to the governor's signature in the fall. Very good. Thank you. And now I'd, I'd like to invite Nancy Eisler with the Board of Professional Engineers, Land Surveyors, and Geologists, and Doug McCauley from the California Architects Board to share information uh, with us about their current recording re reporting requirements for their licensees because as we know, their licensees do report to them of settlements that occurred. So thank you very much for being here today and for your participation. And Ms. Eisler, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hill, Senator Hancock, and Senator Block for, and your staff for including me. I am Nancy Eisler, the Assistant Executive Officer of the Board for Professional Engineers, Land Surveyors, and Geologists. And I was asked to speak on what our board refers to as our reporting of legal actions program. Um, this program was added to our laws during the 2004 sunset review of our board. And the um, chief consultant for the committee was quite surprised to learn our board was one of the few that did not have any kind of reporting requirement. And it, through that sunset review process, it was determined that our laws would be amended to include requirements for our licensees to report certain types of criminal convictions, as well as civil settlements, judgments, and arbitration <laughs> awards. Through our discussions with the committee, our, we agreed to amount of $50,000 or more for all of the civil settlements, judgments, and arbitration awards. Our board was concerned with requiring our licensees to report they recognize that in many cases settlements are simply done because the insurance companies advise they will settle at $50,000 and anything beyond that, if the licensee wishes to pursue it, will be at their own cost. We did feel that $50,000 was appropriate because of that settlement agreement that most insurance companies do include. We also were concerned that the reports would be disclosable or that the board would turn into a clearinghouse of simply reporting that settlements or judgments had occurred. And we did not feel that was appropriate for us as a licensing board because it would give the impression to the public that our board had investigated these matters already. We felt that these should be viewed as simply another way of us finding out of possible violations of our licensing laws, and we would conduct full investigations just as if someone had filed a complaint. 
Hmm. If our investigations did reveal violations and we pursued enforcement action, then the information would be disclosed just as any other information would be disclosed. And um, language was also included at the recommendation of the Department of Finance that our program would not begin until we had a budget appropriation to support and fund the program. That was done in the budget year of 2007-2008, and we had the program become operative January 1st, 2008. In the um, legislative session in 2014, one of the professional associations representing engineers sponsored legislation to change the dollar amounts for settlements to over $50,000 instead of $50,000 or more and to lower the amount for judgments and binding arbitration awards to $25,000. Our board did not take a position on that bill, but from the information we had through the professional associations, it appeared that that would be appropriate that most settlements, especially for engineering cases, are over 50,000 because of the projects that can rise into the millions of dollars and for to lower the amount for judgments and arbitration awards where ha there had been findings either by a court or an arbitrator of actual violations. As I indicated, we do view this as simply another way of finding out about possible violations by our licensees, just as if a complaint had been filed, and we fully investigate them just as we do anything else. We are looking at the work our licensee performed, just as we do in any other case. We do not address why they may have settled. We understand in most cases that is either forced upon them by their insurance company or it's simply a cost of doing business. They tell us we didn't admit fault, we didn't admit guilt. We understand that, but it's our duty to investigate anything that may indicate our licensees have violated the laws. If we determine they did not violate the laws, the matter is simply closed. If they did violate the laws based on the evidence we gather, we then determine what type of enforcement action may be most appropriate, depending on what violations have occurred and how egregious they may have been. We can range from simply advising them of what they need to do to ensure violations don't occur in the future. We can issue administrative citations, or we can pursue formal disciplinary action to revoke or suspend a license. We also do not take on the role of enforcing any kind of judgments or settlement awards. We only look at these as evidence of possible violations of our laws for us to investigate. And that's all I have for my presentation, but if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer Thank them. Thank you. We'll, we'll hear from uh, Mr. McCauley, and then we may have some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McCauley, Chairman. <clears throat> and Nancy, as always, was quite thorough, so I won't um, go through our process necessarily because it's quite analogous to what the engineers board does in terms of intake when they're viewed as board initiated complaints etc so what i'd like to do is share a little bit of history some workload implications and maybe some philosophy as to <laughs> how we view these and how we address them so in terms of history our provisions are much older than those for engineers ours actually go back to governor brown's first administration when he was first elected and as i'm told in terms of the history, the rationale behind enacting these provisions was simply that some boards did not have very robust and effective enforcement programs. And so this was an endeavor to provide additional information to the boards that might um, identify issues that could be, could be pursued enforcement-wise. Our provisions, um, <clears throat> since they've been on the books for quite some time, they have had several uh, evolutions. Our dollar amount is $5,000. As I understand it, it's always been $5,000. And the rationale for that dollar amount, at least for architects, is um, the consumer protection philosophy was let's capture these smaller cases because quite often you might have an architect who's practicing out of his or her back bedroom and doing small residential projects. And quite often those residential projects are where you have the greatest opportunity for consumer harm. So we want to be aware of those cases and understand uh, the factors in the, the resolution of the particular case. We did have a, a dispute or a healthy discussion with the profession about 10 years ago. There was a disagreement as to how we were applying the law. The concern was that we were perhaps applying it too broadly. 
and we did have productive conversations. Ultimately, we secured an opinion from the state attorney general, and we were moving forward collaboratively to work on language. I think it was an offshoot of our, our sunset review process, if I recall correctly. And conveniently, our friends at the engineers board had just gone through this exercise through sunset. And so rather than us wrestling with uh, something from scratch, we utilized the language from engineers board. We viewed it as state of the art. The legislature had just approved it. The governor had just signed it. So it made sense for us with some minor revisions. So that's how we got to where we are today with respect to the language. In terms of workload, just using round numbers, we have 20,000 architects, California licensed architects. We receive approximately 30 reports per year from insurance companies, from architects. Of those approximately, not approximately, of those two to three um, have possible issues. We open a board initiated complaint. We do a complete and thorough investigation and they result in something. Um, in the last five years, ultimately, it's been three that have resulted in something. Two of them were administrative citations, and one was formal discipline against the licensee. So that's our, our quantitative reality for the last five years. In terms of philosophy, we, we certainly understand um, the interest on the part of the profession, the concern on these reports. Um, litigation, settlements, et cetera, are, are frequent um, realities with any project. Um, we all know the old adage, anybody can sue anybody for anything. And quite often in these, everybody's named, every specialty contractor you can think of, et cetera, et cetera. But um, even though that, that 30 complaints represents a healthy workload, um, we take it very, very seriously because we want to prevent that one potential catastrophe. And so that's why we take these very seriously. Um, we investigate exceedingly thoroughly any of those cases that have a, a potential problem. We also, an important piece of ours is we have a practitioner, uh, one of our architect consultants reviewing the cases. These individuals are experienced practitioners who have been involved in settlements when they were practicing with a firm. They understand the realities because just because something was a, a good business decision to settle, it doesn't mean there's not a potential consumer protection problem. So we need to to always be mindful of the fact that just because we resolve something in the civil setting doesn't mean there's not something that needs to be addressed consumer protection wise. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Good thing. Just one comes to mind. Had you not received that information or had the settlements reported to you in the few cases that you had the three citations and the, 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 the reports and the, that you pursued, had you not had those settlements reported to you, would you have moved forward, with, had any opportunity to know that there was a problem that these architects had? The only way we'd know, Senator, would be if the, the consumer, the client, if you will, reported, or if another third party, for example, a contractor, perhaps the building department, that's the only other way we would know. Okay, thank you, and welcome to Senator Bates, the Vice yeah. Chair of our Senate uh, Business and Professions and Economic Development Committee, welcome. Sir. Questions, Senator Hancock? Um, no, thank you. I, you know, one that I could, Ms. Eisler, you talked about the full investigation that may accompany the reporting of the $50,000 settlement amount. How many of those, we understand how many we see from the architects, how many are, are we looking at in terms of reports and then follow up and, and how is that uh, playing out in terms of workload? Well, the the last statistical data I have is from fiscal year 2014-2015, and re we received 54 reports of civil actions, and um, we investigated all of those. I would say about in about half of the cases, we determined there was no violation of our laws by our licensees. We conduct our investigations by asking the subject licensee to provide us with all of the information pertaining to their work on the project. And we have that reviewed by an independent technical expert who is a licensee with expertise in the particular discipline of engineering or land surveying involved. And they provide us with an expert opinion whether or not violations of our licensing laws have occurred, such as negligence or incompetence breach of contract. And 
in the cases where we do determine violations occur, we um, have some where we have advised the subject of our concerns that the violations that were committed were not as egregious to warrant any kind of action against them. In other cases, we have issued administrative citations so that they are aware of the issues that's put on their the record and they are required to pay a fine to the board. In a few cases, and I'm sorry, I do not have the exact numbers with me, we have taken formal disciplinary action because we felt that the negligence and incompetence demonstrated a level that we needed to provide higher level of consumer protection by taking formal disciplinary action and either revoking the license or suspending it or placing it on probation so that the licensee could become re-educated and rehabilitated to present, prevent any future violations. When we first initiated the program, it was quite a workload. We had not really anticipated what would be involved as much as we should have because the majority of the cases settle and they settle with no admissions. So we would get a report that said there was a settlement and the allegations were negligence. And we needed to then get more information to determine what had happened. And that did create some workload for us to begin with. Um, we also would get a lot of information regarding the civil lawsuit, which was not the point of our investigation. The point of our investigation was to look at the engineering or land surveying work that had been done. And so once we were able to better tailor our requests to the licensees to only give us the information about the work they performed, it smoothed out our process and our workload. I see. And how many licensee <coughs> licensees do you have? We have about 100,000 active licenses. Okay, very good. Thank you. I actually yes, do have a question. Um, in talking with um, some architects after this happened, um, their feeling were two things. One was that there were design flaws in this building in addition to the water intrusion and the construction defects um, that um, an architect experienced in water management would not have had a balcony supported by cantilevered wood, which is what that was. And a suggestion that came out of that was that architects are required to take continuing education, but contractors are not. And I wondered if you had any observations or feelings about that. About the continuing education piece? Or? Yeah, or the design piece, either one. Oh, we, as far as I know, our investigation is still open. I can say this much. We've cooperated extensively with the district attorney who led oh, the efforts. Oh, and so you're actually investigating this particular design piece. I didn't realize that. I'm sorry. We've been involved with the district attorney. Okay. That's okay. probably about all I can say. Yeah. But then she concluded that... She was not going to bring a criminal case in that. Okay, thank you. But do you have any comments about continuing education? I can say much more about that. Okay. Um, we do have it as to um, disabled access issues. Um, it's typically an issue in Sunset Review that gets a lot of attention. I do, since we're tracking the issue, mm -hmm. I do know that the governor's vetoed, I believe it's two different pieces of legislation on CE recently. Um, Again, there's a lot of history at the sunset review process on the general policy of continuing education and yeah. whether it's an effective solution to a, a competency issue. Okay. Are there other questions or comments? See, no. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess the. The one, and, and since we're looking at trying to develop some protocol, some, you know, there's a magic number somewhere or a magic threshold that will provide the uh, contractor's license board with the information they need to make the similar evaluations that you're able to make and investigations of uh, potential problem areas. And, and I guess that's, that's the challenge we have. Do you have any suggestions on your, not to tell them how to do it, but 
Any thoughts you may have of uh, that could, knowing that their certainly their size and their number of licensees is a lot greater than than yours, and it then becomes somewhat of a management challenge uh, in a practical stand from a practical standpoint as well. But are there any thoughts that you might be able to share that you you may from your experience? I mean, one approach might be, I mean you need a number to start the conversation. So one approach might be to take $50,000. And in our dialogue during the discussions with the profession 10 years ago, the insurance companies were actually fairly helpful. And so you might be able to, based upon some number, get a snapshot of what the workload actually is, how many settlements take place. That might be a starting point. And then you can start talking about the program and, and how it might look and what the criteria are for reviewing it's, settlements. It's, it's a very good idea. Yeah. I, I would agree with Mr. McCauley. Okay. I think I, that is that is what we did initially. Um, the initial proposal was to match the architect's board at the time, which was $5,000. And our board felt that when it came to engineering cases, the types of cases that we didn't normally hear about were the big projects where there could be a lot of engineers involved that would rise into the millions of dollars. And so they felt that setting the dollar amount higher and at 50000 which was based on settlement <laughs> and insurance companies, that that would get us information about cases we didn't usually hear about because there would be lawsuits and they'd settle and people would get their money and wouldn't think about, oh, I should also let the licensing mm -hmm. board know in case there's evidence of problems for public protection. When the professional association discussed re raising the dollar amount for settlements, they indicated that the threshold settlement level was rising itself and was most likely at $50,000. And they felt that that would be a lot of cases that had just been settled as almost a nuisance case, I mm -hmm. believe is how they described them. And they felt that the more telling cases would be ones that had settled for a higher amount. Even before the dollar amounts changed, the majority of the settlements we got were in the hundreds of thousands. They weren't at just the limit. Okay. So as Mr. McCauley was saying, I think information from parties, insurance companies and all regarding what is <coughs> the settlement level and what types of settlements are there would be very beneficial in trying to determine a dollar amount threshold. Very good, thank you. Um, Ms. Eichler, thank you very much. Mr. McCauley, thank you very much for uh, appearing today. And, uh, thank and you your, for your, including us. Your comments are very helpful. Thank you. Now we'll move to the local and state agency responses to the, the tragic occurrence in, uh, in Berkeley. Uh, Carol Johnson, Acting Planning Director for the City of Berkeley. Ms. Johnson, please come on, come forward. And uh, Mia Marbelli, Executive Director of California Building Standards Commission. Laura Zuniga. Mm -hmm. Chief of Legislative Affairs for the Contractor State License Board, and David Boat, Chief of Enforcement Contractor State License Board. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we have enough room here, I don't know. If four, um, we could bring another chair up there, if that works, all right, great, thank you. I called four names and I see six people, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> the more information, the better. So we'll, we'll, we'll begin with Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Thank you for, uh, for coming this morning and, uh, or afternoon now and uh, appreciate uh, your comments. Thank you. Please begin. Thank you, Chairman Hill and members of the committee. Um, I'm Carol Johnson, the Acting Johnson, Planning Director. Johnson, you can move the microphone down a little bit more for you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I'm Carol Johnson, the Acting Planning Director for the City of Berkeley, and I'm joined today by Alex Rochelle, who is our building official, and Patrick Emmons, who is our supervising building inspector. Thank you for inviting us today. Um, the balcony collapse of June 16th of last year was nothing less than devastating. As was said, six people died and seven people suffered serious injuries. It was an event that had a profound impact on our community and it's something we've worked extremely hard to ensure never happens again. It was clear from our initial investigation that moisture was trapped within the balcony structure that led to dry rot, gradual degradation, and ultimately its collapse. 
because it was an enclosed structure, not only was moisture not able to evaporate, but it also made it the degradation of the structure difficult to um, comprehend. Our investigation of the collapse has led to three main recommendations that have since been um, codified in an ordinance. Firstly, we change requirements for materials that can be used on balconies and other exterior structures. Those materials are now required to be more resistant to moisture. Secondly, we change the design of the structures. Not only do they need to have ventilation, but also access for visual inspections. And thirdly, we required inspections of all exterior structures for buildings with an R1 or R2 occupancy within six months after adoption of our ordinance and for every five years thereafter. So our ordinance was adopted less than 30 days after the collapse of the balcony and Berkeley now has the strongest set of measures to ensure safety of balconies and similar exterior structures than any other city in the state. Our, in our inspection program requires that existing multi-unit buildings be inspected and verified by a licensed professional. If structures are not completely visible, then destructive testing is required. Results of the program to date demonstrate the significant impact of our inspection program. We have had 5,560 property owners submit forms out of 6,100 that were notified. That's a 91% response rate. Of those, 2,660 properties were identified as not having any exterior elevated elements, leaving 2,900 properties that required inspections. Um, 604 of those required corrective work. Clearly the inspection program, as we've implemented it, is, was needed and is effective. Though there were some property owners who were initially very resistant to the idea, they've sent, sent, sent us letters thanking us for bringing this issue to their attention. Obviously the program has caught things that would have passed um, if we hadn't otherwise implemented our, our ordinance. In conclusion, our heartfelt condolences go out to the family members who lost loved ones or were otherwise affected by the collapse. We hope that the significant programs we put in place assures that nothing like this will ever happen again. Um, I have both our building official and, and uh, senior inspection supervisor here, and we can answer any more uh, questions you may have about the details of our program.